This is Pixelated Audio, episode 115, and you're listening to the music of Quartet. Destroy the bomb. Only if we open the door. Open the door. Welcome to Pixelated Audio, a podcast focusing on game music, its history, and the people behind it. Today, uh, we're going to be listening to the music of Quartet, also known as Double Target from the Arcade and the Mark III or Master System, as well as a few other ports. We're your hosts. I'm Brian. This is Gene. And we've also got a third host for this episode, a good friend of the show, Norm, also known as Normally Retro. Thanks for joining us today, dude. No problem. I'm loving it already. Awesome. Awesome. So that track that brought us in. Uh, well, there was two tracks for this one. Uh, it was the Miami Samba Machine and the quartet theme from the arcade version composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. So that first track is the intro. You put in your coins and you get your mission. Basically, uh, fight the boss, find the key, open the door. Pretty simple stuff. And then it drops you straight into that quartet theme and you know you're you're where you need to be. Yeah, it's it's simple, right? Like this is like embodies everything about the 80s and it mm-hmm. does it such in in such a jump kind of way <laughs> i love it it's really good norm what do you think the funny thing about the theme is that intro that synth intro where it goes down and back up that you know you almost know that it's a theme when i made a cd out of this i literally called that the theme of quartet and it happened to be called quartet <laughs> theme it was just so weird and that's what it was awesome so uh why did we decide on doing quartet today it's come up a few times in the discord channel maybe you can answer that for us norm I, again this is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time even when i heard it in the arcades i loved it and then when it came to the home systems i used to play the sound test all the time when i found it i think it was in like game pro or egm or something like that and i used to just sit and listen to that and plus the uh the graphics are so cool where the, the girls like has the uh, baton and then like the opa opa's flying around so it was <laughs> The whole setting was cool. The music is good. I used to love it. So did you play this on the Master System mostly or in the arcade? Actually both. Uh, It was, people talk about this online and they don't like see it as being like revered or anything like that. But I remember in my arcade, Aladdin's Castle uh, in Chicago, that people used to play the four player one a lot. Like it used to uh, garner a crowd and like. You know, coins were on top of the machine. You know how you do like old school, put a coin to say you're next or something like that? Oh, yeah. Of like, course. I used to play it all the time. Then when it came to the home system, I was like, oh, this is awesome. That we got to the home system, but they only had the two characters. I liked uh, Lee and I forget the other guy's name. That no, will get uh, to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like those other guys, too. And I was like, oh, man, if there's four players, it'd be so awesome. But, you know, I love it. You only get what you can get on the home the home uh, ports and stuff. But it's pretty it's a pretty damn good home port, so uh, we'll get mm-hmm. into some of the music of that later. First of all, you know, Norm, thanks again for joining us. 
if you don't know Norm, uh, join the Discord server. He's in there posting tracks, commenting. He's one of the moderators, and he's been a longtime friend of the show. And so uh, it's just it, it's awesome for us to be able to finally get you on an episode. And that's why Gene and I were talking about doing a quartet show, and we're like, we got to get Norm on. It's it's time. So uh, I'm glad everything worked out. And we we had some kinks in the beginning uh, getting the uh, the equipment set up, but uh, everything's working now. So. Let's keep things rolling. Yeah, Norm is also the voice of the Hardcore Gaming 101's 40, the top 47K games. So if you open that up and you listen and you hear that that awesome theme song in the beginning, that's our, our man here. Dude, randomly during the day, I'll just start rapping to myself, like, dog's power. <laughs> oh, I'll say, I, you know, I, <laughs> that gets in your head. <laughs> it's so fun. The, I mean, the quick story about that, uh, he said he would like to have somebody say something about dog's power. And it was like, right when I got to the end of it, I was just like, Dogs Bauer. <laughs> I, I love that they just put a quote from Dogs Bauer randomly at the end of that intro, and it's just like whatever quote they can find. I know. That's yeah. the best. Oh, God. Um, 47K Games, we're going to have to do some kind of crossover. Some kind of yeah. crossover. I mean, like we're friends with some of the guys, and it's just, it's bound to happen. I don't know why it hasn't yet. So um, yep. eventually, I guess. But uh, yeah, Norm, you were on an episode, uh, what, like a few weeks ago? Yeah, the Fantasy Star one. That one was really fun. Yeah, that was an excellent yeah. show. So if you haven't listened to that episode of 47K Games, go listen to it. Uh, hear our man Norm talking about um, the shield that he uh, gave up. <laughs> gave up <laughs> I'll never forget that. I, you, think I'm, you think I'm lying. I literally stopped playing it. <laughs> hey, you know what? I uh, took myself to another planet and then committed suicide, and I couldn't get back to the spaceship. So I screwed myself in Fantasy Star 1. <laughs> It happens. Uh, exactly. All right. So let's get to it. Quartet is a four player action platformer released in the arcades in 1986, developed and published by Sega for their pre system 16 arcade hardware. And by pre system 16, I mean that the arcade hardware falls into this kind of small window between 1985, where Sega hadn't really finalized their system 16 machine, the 16 uh, bit successor to the system one and system two, home of like Golden Axe, Altered Beast, Shinobi, and Fantasy Zone. However, in this early phase of the hardware, they still had some games developed for it anyway, like Alien Syndrome, Body Slam, and Major League. But really, the only difference between the pre-System 16 and the System 16A, which was the first revision of the uh, System 16, uh, was a clock speed difference. So uh, essentially, what we're getting today is System 16. It's still considered six System 16 software. And um, we get all of the the good stuff that comes with that. And especially, this is a really hot time for Sega in the arcades. Yeah, and both mm-hmm. versions of it still have that 2151 FM board. So you don't see any differences there. Exactly, exactly. Now, the track we just heard was from the arcade version using the 8-channel OPM or the YM2151. But let's jump into the Sega Master System port soundtrack real quick for PSG take on the quartet theme.
That was the quartet theme, or round one, for the Sega Master System version, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. This is so faithful to the arcade version that I, I almost couldn't believe it. I mean, it sounds, I mean, of course it's PSG, but it sounds like the, the, the bass and everything just mirrors the FM as far as pitch and everything. It just, it, I, I was shocked actually to see that it was so good on such a simple sound hardware. Yeah, I don't come back to many SMS soundtracks that much, but this one I find myself listening to quite a bit. Even before this show, way many years ago, it was always just something that I would want to listen to. Yeah. That's the theme of, uh, like, really good composition, uh, composition because, like, you know, the FM uh, obviously has so much more power than the SMS, but still it comes through just, like, so melodically and it's so colorful, you know. I, I really love this song a lot. And it's really memorable. I think that if you had purchased the home console version, even though it's slightly different than the arcade, not just the audio, but just the whole package, I don't think you'd be disappointed at all. There's a lot to love. And the time signature, if you look at the time, so the, the first track before it hits the loop is a minute 49. This is a minute 48. The time, um, the, the clock and everything for this, everything just is synced up perfectly. And I think that's a, a really awesome quality that they were able to keep everything so identical between the arcade and the, the home console port. Yep. So let's talk about Quartet and the development real quick. Gene, you have some notes on uh, Rieko Kodama, right? I sure do. So Rieko Kodama was the character designer, but she actually plays a pretty big role at Sega. So I wanted to make special mention of her. So Before she started at Sega, she was trying to figure out what to do with her life, couldn't decide between graphic design and archaeology, ended up flunking out of school, and then decided to attend a trade school. Maybe this sounds familiar to some of us, you know, trying to figure out what we're doing in our lives. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) She ended up going into the game industry and a few years later joined Sega in 1984, where she started off as a sprite artist under Yoshiki Kawasaki, the artist for Flicky and a few of Sega's other early titles. After a few years, she got the chance to do graphics for both the arcade and SMS versions of Quartet. And like many early Sega employees, she wasn't allowed to use her real name and often went by Phoenix Rie in game credits. Now, the story doesn't end here. In 1987, she worked on the original Fantasy Star as a character artist. Uh, Norm, you were repping Kodama over there in HD 101. (laughs) (laughs) Afterwards, she became even more involved in the Fantasy Star series in 2 and 4, the ones that people associate as kind of the core early series. And by the time she was working on 4, she was the director, but also continued to do much of the game art as well. That's pretty impressive, first off. So in addition to Fantasy Star, Kodama worked on a number of titles, including Altered Beast on the Genesis, and was the junior designer on Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2. In the mid-90s, she was the director for Magic Knight Rare Earth for the Saturn. And the I, pre- love, I love that game, by the way. I Did do too. It? Yeah, it's yeah. actually a really yeah. solid, kind of easy, but fun RPG to this day i still pop that in the saturn every now and then just because that's the top de- down one yeah, right? i was gonna say it was a working yeah design. yeah working designs actually did the port uh or the uh brought it to north america so you can tell it's going to be a quality release uh anything working designs i wanted to play it i uh, saw it i was really into like working designs at that time you know like with lunar and the sequel to lunar which is vey <laughs> oh, <that's an> inside <laughs> joke <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I loved everything Working Designs came out with. Uh, real quick about the character design, I love her character design. Uh, like specifically in Quartet, uh, I know you said you want to get to it, but Lee, I really like Lee. <laughs> he, he looks like the janitor, that, but he's just like with a gun. <laughs> it's like, just, like shooting around the space land. Like he has the mustache, you know, looks all scruffy. I, I love the way she draws uh, her uh, characters. Yeah, I have the feeling Brian is going to do me up to look like Lee in the in the, in the, in the show. Notes. The show. <laughs> now, did you did you um, find like did she do the artwork for the arcade and the box art and stuff too? I don't I know. Think I think she's mostly system... like sprite art for the first couple of games that she was working on. Okay, I think the Sega Master System box art. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Is just sprites from the game. Yeah, terrible ones. Yeah. They're not really sprites. It's kind of like these stylized uh, representations. That was kind of SMS yep, box art yep. back in the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyways, it's, so... Uh, let me, yeah, let me just finish up real quick. <laughs> I was going to say, Magic Knight Re-Earth. Yeah, so where are we leaving off? All right. She was also the producer for pretty much all the releases of Skies of Arcadia. More recently, she was the producer for the Seventh Dragon series, which is a really good series of RPGs. Uh, the PSP ones are, are great. I've, I've played those quite a bit. And then... Even more recently, in the last few years, she's been working as a producer on the Sega Aegis Switch ports for OutRun, Alex Kidd, 
Puyo Puyo and virtual racing, probably a few more things that are in the works. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. She's done so much stuff. I can't believe it. Yeah, she's touched so many franchises at Sega. It's almost, it, it's just hard to believe. Yeah, and typically, in you know, on the show, we we try to keep everything to the music and maybe just some of the development stuff. But this was, she was such a, like a hallmark figure at Sega. Yeah, and just to round it out, she's been at Sega for 35 years. That is just an incredible career achievement. And being a mentor to other designers, because she's been through pretty much the entire thing, starting as a graphic artist, all the way up to director and producer. And just last year, or just this year, actually, she was given an award at GDC 2019 for a Pioneer Award for all of this work, all of this incredible stuff that she's done. Yeah, well, well well-deserved. Absolutely. Real. Clap, clap, clap. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so... uh, Oh, uh-huh. I was her, her name should be as well known as like Yuji Naka and Yu, Yu Suzuki to me. You, you would think so, right? I, yeah. I'm kind of surprised that that uh, we don't hear more mention of of like her name. But I mean, everybody knows all the stuff she's worked on. It's you no, know, it's it's nuts. It's yeah. everywhere. So, yep. um, anyways, let's get back. Let's jump from the art side back over to the music side. Norm, what do we have up next on the list? Looks like we're going to listen to one of my favorite quartet songs with the funky bass, FM Funk. Right, that was FN Funk from the arcade version of Quartet, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. Got to give room for everybody there. You got a bass solo, you got a drum solo, so many different parts going on there. Oh man, this is a this is a killer track. You know that bass. As soon as I hear it, I think of Namiki. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah, just definitely. sounds like Namiki's bass. But I, just, I mean, this is so early too. I mean, 1986, and they're getting that funky in the arcade. Is pretty impressive. I'm getting a Rolling Thunder or Moonwalker kind of vibe from this one. A lot of really, really funky tunes. I like the rhythm of the drums at the end. It's like you know, they really went crazy on the drum roll. And that snare is so like, I almost want to say iconic because it, you know, with all those games in the early 80s, it was, I, the snare is just, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like, you know. Well, let me, let's see if we can hear it real quick. Let me pull that one apart. One second here. It's almost got like a, a like a pitch, like a tone to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like a laser gun almost. <laughs> it's like a la- oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, no, the the bass just laying on top of this that that drum set is incredible. I'm gonna say that over and over through the soundtrack, but I, I don't know how many times I used to hum that back as a kid. It's it's almost like it's tripping over itself a little bit. Like hmm. there's some weird kind of syncopation and stuff towards the end, especially. Yeah, I mean the bass definitely drives that whole thing. It's got to FM funk. Yeah, it's funk. Yeah, <laughs> what more do you can you say about it? Yeah, well, let's jump ship real quick and uh, listen to the Master System version of the same track.
right, that was FM Funk, or Stage 4, from the Sega Master System version of Quartet. Again, this is such a mirror image of the arcade version that you don't lose anything. I even like the bass, how it kind of rolls off and has those little tiny glissandos that make it sound like it's a, like a slap bass or something. It's, it's awesome. The first thing I always think of every time I hear it after the arcade is like, oh, right, the SMS doesn't have those low bass tones. But after <laughs> everything starts to come in, it's like, you know, it's doing its own thing and it's doing it really well. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it because it fills up those elements that aren't able to be done by the SMS. But just because of the, uh, I guess, the melodies he picks and it just sounds like it's so much, even though it's just like what? three different tones probably i mean and to be fair it the uh the arcade version is only like four channels it's not even using all eight and so mm -hmm. uh, i i think it was probably a little bit easier of a conversion uh for uh hayashi-san to do because he didn't really have to break it down you know he didn't have to turn eight into three i guess you know the ratio is a little bit it's a little bit easier in that that sense maybe i think it goes back to what somebody was saying that the strength of the original compositions is such that you really don't feel like anything's missing, even though it is a, you know, less powerful sound chip. Yeah. The thing about this track that's kind of special is that it was reused in another game. Norm, you want to tell us about that? I can tell you exactly where I was. I was at an arcade about, what, uh, t 10, 12 years old, something like that. And I was playing Spider-Man because what do you do at 10, 12, 12 years old? You play Spider-Man. Sounds and, about right. And, you know, got to like the third level and I'm like, wait a minute, is this the quartet song? You know, I'm, <laughs> and then nobody knows anything that I'm talking about because who listened to game music back in the 80s? But, you know, I was there like, Except oh my like God, I don't even want to Except like every Japanese play. person ever. <laughs> in America, not so much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, me, yeah, I was all into game music and I noticed it as soon as like the first, you know, you that first bass line, that role is just unmistakable and once you hear it it's like oh my god this is the uh, quartet song yeah and you know you can't mistake it for anything else but this is its own kind of unique version too so let's take a listen to the fm funk track in spider-man for the arcade Spider-Man, the arcade version, and that was FM Funk. I I gotta say, the quartet version is a lot better, uh, in yep. my opinion. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it, the bass is a little more splatty. It's still cool, don't get me mm. wrong, but... Uh, I like the gated drums a lot in this one, but I feel like there's something weird going on with the stereo field, or, or I feel like I'm going deaf every time I listen to it. It's like, <laughs> it's coming in in weird spots. Yeah, it's a little bit unbalanced, I think. But I appreciated it was there. Yes, of course. Spider-Man, I don't want to go too much on a tangent, but uh, Spider-Man is a really fun game if Spider-Man only moved like more than, you know, like one step at a time. He's so slow in this game that it makes it so hard to play. Oh, it drives me nuts. I gotta say, I do have a memory of this game playing it in arcades, and that first level where you're fighting Venom and he's scaling and he's getting bigger, you're like, oh, I beat him up, the guy's gone, and then he gets like 10 times bigger, and you're like, oh my god. Yeah. That was pretty that impressive. That was pretty cool. I remember that. <laughs> yep, yeah. yep, yep. It's a good way to start off the game. And the voices for this one is, uh, they're really weird too. Like, every time you beat somebody, they go, hi, or some like weird scream. <laughs> but, 
But my nephew really loves this uh, game, and he actually started singing some. Of the, I love it when like you see kids singing the music, and he started singing one of the more jazzy songs on here. I can't remember the uh, title of it, but yeah, it was really awesome. Nice, nice. So let's talk about Katsuhiro Hayashi just a little bit. So he also went by the name Funky KH or Q-chan. His website is, is still around, even though it looks like it was made in the early 90s. Uh, this is Q-chan. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a bunch of um, top 10 lists of cat things. Let's be fair, it was the late 90s. There's lots of little graphics on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, geez. Anyways, yeah, he's a composer from Wakayama, Japan, and he worked at Sega from 1984 to 1988 and was in charge of the Consumer Arcade Division sound team. He worked closely with Hiroshi Kawaguchi and was a former member of SST Band with Koichi no Miki in charge of Super Hang On. But he was in charge of many other joint efforts with the group after going freelance. While he was at Sega, he worked on Girls' Garden for the SC-3000 and Zaxxon for the SG-1000. He worked on Hang On, Black Belt, Fist of the North Star, and which is also Hokuto no Ken. Uh, Rambo, First Blood Part 2 for the SMS. Uh, SDI for the arcade, Super Hang On with Koichi no Miki. Galaxy Force 1 and 2, also with Namiki. Gain ground for the arcade with Yo Dolphin Takata. And after leaving Sega, he joined Nova from 1988 to 1989. I didn't know much about Nova, but apparently they developed a few things, kind of like Ghost developed a few different titles. So there was Final Lap Twin for the TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine, Altered Beast for the PC Engine, Lupin the Third, and Zoid's Densetsu for the Game Boy. He then turned to freelance work. During his freelance time, he got a contract gig for Media Rings and did a few games for them. And in 2005, he joined Takao, a pachinko company, and ended up doing sound there for a while. And maybe still is, we don't really know. However, his fame comes from his time at Sega and the work that he did as a freelancer, particularly well-loved for the River King fishing games, which is harvest fishing in Europe. I think it was popular there as well. And also the UQ Genso Kyoku series, uh, which is a visual novel friendship simulator by MediaWorks. Friendship simulator. We all need one of those. We all <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You feel I better about yourself <laughs> than a princess maker. Oh uh, yeah, Even yeah. <laughs> Princess Maker then Friendship Simulator on top of it. I think for the most part he stopped composing for games around 2005. He's done a few little things here and there, but I haven't seen any major credits for him recently. No, in 2005, yeah, he joined the Pachinko company and it as far as I can tell, everything he's updated on his website, which is actually a lot more recent than 1998, uh it looks like he's still there. He even has a little bio and he's like, "Yep, I'm I'm just doing pachinko sound stuff." So, apparently he's making really good money cuz there's no reason to go back to games, but you know, maybe he'll make a return one day. As well he should because he has made some of my favorite uh soundtracks of all time looking at that list. Yeah, I went some uh I went through some of his TurboGrafx 16 stuff when he was at Nova and uh those are top soundtracks. They're really good. Mm -hmm. A little bit different. So at first I was a little thrown off. I was like, oh, this is really him? But sure enough, you can kind of hear those bass influences come out, especially in not necessarily Al Altered Beast, which is kind of like a, an arrangement, right? But uh, Lupin the Third and Zoid's Densetsu, there's some some nice funk going on in there. Yeah. I listened to a lot of the Galaxy Force 2 soundtrack and I love Beyond the Galaxy. The rest oh, of the soundtrack is great, but I thought it was all Namiki. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's, I know. Like, I, I didn't realize he basically did every other track except for Beyond the Galaxy. So, yeah, it's one of those things because Namiki gets a lot of credit because he's so well known for his funk and bass and stuff that maybe yeah. his name was overshadowing, but I don't know. Anyways, let's uh, get in some more Hayashi music. And next, we got Sky for the arcade version of Quartet.
Lord. I know. I love that track so much. I know. That's those last chords. Oh my God. <laughs> really? Oh, I know. All right. That was Sky from the arcade version of Quartet, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. Um, yeah, man. This is a uh, man. The first time I heard, it, I was like, "Is there something wrong with the file? Is like, does it just skip around like this?" Sure enough, like this is he composed it exactly to sound just like that. So I have a few things to say about this one. Number no. one, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, this is clearly the synth and drum programming of a keyboardist. And one of those is a compliment and one of them is not. Like, the chords are so good. And I write the same kind of doofy percussion if I don't really think about it. It's, I, it sounds cool, but it's clearly not from a drummer. Right, right, and right. Mm -hmm. Second, I love it when songs use hemiola. That's that three against two. You have like everything's going in duple and you have da, 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 da. And these triplets going along in the background. It, it's such a great effect. I love it when songs do that. And the last thing is that little intro melody gets stuck in my head all the time. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> this this is a great one. This is another one that I'm, I'm not lying. I literally called this one like clouds in the sky when I named it myself because, you know, I didn't know the names of it back then. But it literally feels like like a blue sky. I, this is corny, but this is the way I listen to my game music. And I can only listen to this like when it's a blue sunny sky outside. I, I love this song. Awesome. There's just such a cool chord color throughout this piece it's just mm -hmm. you can get i just feel like i get kind of swept up in it i mean the cloud analogy is good it's sort of very uplifting right. but without necessarily being like super triumphant or positive i don't know mm -hmm. anyways let's listen to the same track on the sega master system this is sky or stage two by Katsuhiro Hayashi for the SMS. It's great track, don't get me wrong, but it lost a little bit of the original, the oddness, I guess, of the arcade version, but on its own, it stands, stands strong, I think. I think they had to pick some really unusual note choices when they don't have the full power of those FM chords. Right. It has a bit of a wistful or ambiguous quality i don't know if that's the right word but something about it just sort of was like a little bit more like i don't know it's i really like it but it's definitely not the same track compared to some of the other ones considering this is all i had back then <laughs> i just had no choice to love it but i mean for me it's like my brain would fill in the chords that the ghost chords i would call them because they weren't there but you know i can imagine what would be there if it were there right, so. right i get you but I mean, I, I understand though. You know, it's never going to match up to the FM. So no, no, and and I I don't mean it like that too. I don't mean like oh, it has to be in parody because obviously it can't. But I think that um, if if you were going to compare like what the original kind of qualities are that make that arcade version sound the way it does, I don't think it translated over to the master system yep. quite in the same way as the other tracks. Now, if you hear this track on its own and you don't do any comparison, I think it's a fantastic track. I think mm -hmm. it's, just, it's perfect. I mean, this could fit in like a Sonic pocket adventure it, like right away. I mean, I think that it would just match anything like high energy, nice kind of wistful, like you said, action and platforming and just 
has that really kind of lofty feel to it. I like it. Yeah. It's got a bit of a heartfelt feel to the melody. I don't know if you picked up on that. It feels I get that, yeah. It feels like a sincere song. Like, I don't know. I, I can't quite put my no, finger on it. When you said that, I actually know exactly what you mean. It, from the jump, it starts off like that. Uh, yeah. Not not the not the intro part, but like you know the when the first like phrase for the song comes in, it right, does right. sound like that. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, jump back over into uh, quartet a little bit. Gene, you uh, found the the back of the box and you got the the story right. Now the, there is no story that I could find. I was looking in the manual for the arcade <laughs> and stuff. There was no story written at all. So they must have come up with something for this. Well, you heard the arcade story in the very beginning of the show. Basically, you got to find that key and kill the boss. But <laughs> yeah, that, that's the story. <laughs> but here's the story from the back of the Sega Master System box. If you hate aliens, you'll love Quartet. You see, <laughs> <laughs> Space Colony Number 9 is being threatened by an invasion of the most dangerous kind, alien attack, and the place is crawling with them. These vicious, vile parasites have even managed to confiscate the casket of the late, great Queen Cynthia. There's no exclamation points in there, is it? No, it's all, a lot of periods, a lot of pauses there. Wait, did you write it like that? No, that... that is how it was written on the box. <laughs> Just a lot of these alien full attack. stops. <laughs> Just, yeah. If you hate aliens, <laughs> it's your job to exterminate these treacherous creatures, to return the casket to its hallowed tomb and save the colony from certain collapse. These pauses are in there, it's not from me. You'll have special equipment to help you along the way, like a supersonic jet engine, a special bomb, missiles, and a magic key. But time is running out, so don't just stand there thinking about it. Get on it and get rid of this gruesome group for good. So I uh, have a problem with the way you read that because <laughs> you made it sound way more interesting than it looks like it's written here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they added a story, right? Yeah, they put some some work into it, I guess. Um, I mean, I didn't ever know there was a story. I played mostly on the arcade, the arcade version. And um, yeah, I had no idea. I thought it was just, you know, pick. Well, I mean, the, arcade like, just, the arcade just loops. So there is no true ending. But apparently, because yeah, I could never get the key on uh, stage four, one of those. But apparently when in the ending, you do rescue a queen. Like she's like encased in some crystal or something like that. Uh, like some oh, web. I guess it's the uh, the casket. The... That's in the Master System version. I saw the end. The Master but... System, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. There's like an anime kind of cutscene where you go and see this frozen queen. Oh, know, that's she's right. Like pink or purple or whatever. I did. Hair. I did watch a playthrough of the ending because I, I wasn't sure. I never made it that far. <laughs> but yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's it. Yeah, it's a tough game. I think that uh, the arcade version is. Uh, definitely a quarter eater but let's uh let's talk about the gameplay a little bit so it's this 80s anime futuristic science fiction game kind of like a cross between gauntlet and rolling thunder you can play with up to four players which was i mean obviously given the name quartet but this was a big thing for arcades because there wasn't a lot doing this especially in 86 i remember playing this at chuck E. cheese's that's where we played it because we had you know birthday parties and stuff there kids had birthday parties this was the like the game where you could get together with a lot of people and play. And it was either this or yep. Gauntlet or like Ninja Turtles, but that came out much later. Yeah, so, I definitely got a bit more of the Gauntlet in the arcades that I was going to. Oh, but yeah. totally, totally. Um, I And I played a lot more Gauntlet too because Elf needs food badly. You know, you can't. Get <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's four characters. Uh, there's Lee, who is the blue character. Joe, who is the yellow character. Mary, who is the red character. And Edgar, who is green. And the goal of this stage is to find the boss, who is always just circling around the door, and defeat him to get the key to open the door and exit. Uh, you can move around, jump, shoot weapons, crouch to avoid enemies, crawl through passageways. Kind of what you would expect from any arcade platformer from the late 80s early 90s but what's nice about this is there's a lot of different pickups that changes the gameplay around so there's the speed boots you can kind of move around a lot quicker there is a uh, spring so you can jump higher invincibility shields a jet pack which is the coolest part and everybody wants to get the jet pack whenever you play yeah because... you got to fight over it there's sort of this singular jet pack throughout some of the stages and whoever's got it gets to fly around forever right. until they get hit Right, right, yep. right. And then when you get hit, somebody else can pick it up. So you're kind of like running, oh, I want to grab the jetpack. Yeah. And there's different weapon power ups and like a thing that can stop time and different health pickups, all these little collectibles for uh, for scoring points. But the game itself is just a blast. And I think it's a, a perfect game. If you need a game to play with a buddy, uh, sit down, even two player. It's a ton of fun. 
and they all have like their different weapons. You know, like uh, I think Edgar has like the arrow, and Mary has the like automatic that shoots out like three different bullets and it makes like a little cool sound. Right, the, right, right. Also, also what's cool about this is the animation on the characters. It's like uh, really detailed. Like when you crouch, you have to. It takes like a second to actually go down to the floor, and then you do this like little crawl while you're yeah, crawling yeah, on the ground. Yeah. It's really cool. Did you play this with four players ever, or was it mostly the the Master System version for uh, playing with a with a buddy? I played a lot on the home system, but the arcade is where it was like the more action. And like you said about the uh, jetpack, like it was always a fight to get the jetpack because <laughs> everybody wanted to fly around the, uh, the screen. But uh, it was just mad, you know, madcap chaos. Like, because so much was going on with four people and, like, you dying, like, every 10 seconds because like, it's, like, <laughs> uh, an obstacle everywhere you step. Yeah, so, and yeah. it's one-hit kill for mm -hmm. pretty much everything, right? So your guy just, like, lays down. You got to, like, wait to, to get back up. The thing is, Gene and I were playing this together the other day. Uh, we spent, like, an hour and a half trying to get the thing working together over the internet. Yeah, but I, <laughs> after, we, after we got it going, it was like, oh, this is cake. I don't know why. Like, we just had some weird difficulty but when we started playing it was so much fun it was so much fun yeah, and yeah, it's really cool. uh, and and the fact that you can jump off of each other's heads and stuff like that makes it even more chaotic <laughs> because you know yeah. these platforms sometimes you have to fit into very small gaps to get through without getting hit and you got a guy in front of you like one of your your team and uh they're completely blocking your path and so it, it has this frustration element that uh that you get with any other you know like i, I don't know like mario playing that two players i really wanted you to like i, I wish we had the microphones on because i wanted to yell like brian stand still i'm gonna jump on your head and shoot at the boss <laughs> <laughs> i didn't figure it out <laughs> um but yeah the trapeze work <laughs> before we talk about the sms version we should probably mention that there's actually two versions of quartet the original arcade version which is like a four-player Wherever you stand on the arcade machine is where your coin is, and you play as that character. Right, right. And in Quartet 2, it's a two-player conversion, so you can pick any one of the four characters, but there's only two players. The main difference between them is really just for the smaller cabinets. There's not much difference otherwise. Right. The name is a bit misleading because Quartet 2 sounds like the second iteration of the game, but really it's just a conversion kit to be able to play two player instead of four yeah very 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 minor differences yeah if you look at them if you look at the main rom they're even combined in the same because it's just like a delta update or something yeah those three games always confuse me afterburner 2 galaxy force 2 and quartet 2 and i'm like where's the difference <laughs> <laughs> they probably figured this game was so successful it had a sequel yeah kind of get people to, to play it that way yeah you know <laughs> everybody's trying to make their money the Sega Master System version, though, uh, is a completely revamped game, right? S similar gameplay, but we played that together as well. It's yeah, a, a lot bit. different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, it kind of looks the same, but it's a little bit more... The stages are... There's only six stages, but each of them is a bit longer. Except I think the first stage is pretty short. But there's a bit more of a maze-like structure to the stages. You kind of go between screens. You, like, go through a door. You end up in another area... So it can be quite an interconnected thing as opposed to the arcade where you have these like single long screens that are very, very horizontal. So right. it's really cool, but almost it's almost a different game that's it was in that era of home conversions, of course, where they got the idea yeah. there, but they didn't really it's not really a port. Yeah, yeah. It's kinda like the Strider or Bionic Commando for NES. They're totally different games, but they capture the feel of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Master System version is, to me, a lot... Well, they're both difficult, but this is, you know, it's because of more, more, it's more like a quest. So you have to kind of like, you know, uh, there's like hidden keys and you have to have like a, a a guide for it. Otherwise, you just won't find the key, like on, like on the fourth level, I think it is. But uh, if you don't have the keys, you can't get to the final level. So it's just like you have to keep going back to the stage until you get the key, sort of like the ninja where you have to find all the scrolls for that. So yeah, it, right, it was a tough right. game. You know, I think that the Sega master system version was a little more challenging, not just the adventure yeah. kind of searching maze like aspect, but just the control. Now the control was tight, but there was a lot, it was a lot easier to die. I think there was a lot more gaps and pits to fall into. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, but and I think the bullets right. also seemed a little bit bigger. Yeah. I feel like. It, yeah. Maybe, or the, maybe it's just because we were sucking more at it. I don't know. But uh, it felt like the, uh, it felt like the, the Master System version was a lot more challenging. 
there's a cheat you can use at the beginning to use uh, like that wave gun that Edgar usually has. So it makes it a, a little bit easier. Nice. So uh, the Sega Master System version, when it was ported over, or I'm sorry, when it was brought to the U.S., they made one difference, right, for the uh, the character of Mary. So, and I guess in the Master System version, Mary is more Asian looking. She's got like black hair and uh, looks a little bit different. And in the Master System version that was brought to the U.S., they uh, gave her blonde hair and made her look a little bit more like uh, Sigourney Weaver from Aliens. Yeah, if you look up the box art, you'll see the the Japanese one has dark black hair. Yeah, yeah. I guess that was a, like a regional difference between them. And we should probably um, mention that you only can pick from Mary and Edgar in the Master System version. So they right. smartly called it double target in Japan rather than quartet because it's like there's two <laughs> that players. Does, that doesn't make any, yeah, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's still called quartet here, though. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts about the gameplay uh, before we move on to some more music? I think we got everything covered. <laughs> we got it all <laughs> covered. All right, so this next track is the Oki Rap, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi for the arcade version of Quartet. It's so right, cheesy, yeah. but it's so dope. <laughs> <laughs> There's something super endearing about that era when nobody knew how sampling worked. Uh, like, yeah. like, <laughs> re- <laughs> just re-trigger that sample. <laughs> All right, that was the Oki Rap from the arcade version of Quartet. And uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's just so many elements to latch onto in all these tracks. It's a short soundtrack, but every single one of these is is, is a favorite, really. And then you hear that little, like... Uh, like Brazilian samba feel on a you know yeah, they always yeah, have yeah. that kind of uh, Latin feel to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. That's one of my favorite tunes. But I mean, like I said, yeah. I'm gonna keep saying it with like every song on here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good soundtrack, man. Every every single track just kind of like outdoes itself a little bit more. And I think it's just it's so powerful and it's very short. It's like this whole soundtrack is like ten minutes. You know, just yep. very very cool. Real quick, let's switch over to the Sega Master System version. That was Oki Rap or Stage 3 from the SMS version of Quartet. That's a good one. It's a good, mm-hmm. 
It's a really good standalone track. I like it. Some really choice use of the pitch bend there. I think I think that's a really effective tool in the Master System version. Yeah. And one thing I forgot to bring up about the last version, the arcade version, is that the reason why we're hearing those audio samples is not coming through the YM2151. The System 16 actually had a, a, another a, a DAC on it that could do three channels of 80 PCM. And uh, that's why he was able to line those, uh, you know, the speech up with Oki Rap of the music on the uh, FM to uh, to create that track. We, we lost it in the, the Master System version, unfortunately, but the track really does stand alone pretty well, I think. Yeah, and the uh, staticky drums are really cool, you know. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> the rhythm is there. So. Oh yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> still, still a great track. Yeah, still a great track. So, uh, moving on, we have another version uh, from Spider-Man that we want to just play a little comparison to. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> because why not? Hey, why they not? wrote some music and it's good, so they can't let it go to waste. Yeah, so this is from <laughs> Spider-Man, the video game in the arcade. was Oki Rap for the Spider-Man arcade video game composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. Uh, it kind of lost something in this in this version as well to me. The drums are kind of obnoxious, i got to say. Of the two, though, I like this one a little bit better of the Spider-Man version, got to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This I can't, is, I can't this lie to you. I actually like this version. It's kind of uh, hard-hitting and powerful. You like this version better than the arcade version? Uh, There's something yeah. wrong with you. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so wrong yeah, with you. That I'm arcade version is so much better. <laughs> I'm gonna go. And there's for, no, I just like there's the no rap. I, I can I, see it though. I mean, it's got some pretty nice samples in this game. So and and it leans pretty heavily on those drums. You know, totally fits for Spider-Man. I mean, it didn't really have to be in quartet. It could have been anything. So I guess exactly. might as well just reuse it. But what matters though is that the composition is tight. Oh yeah, that doesn't change whatever mm -hmm. version you're listening to. So yep. uh, there is another. There's another. There's another track. Uh, yet it, it's still a rap uh, from uh, Mr. Hayashi that I want to play. This is actually in the arcade. So if you flip the dip switch over to um, service mode, you can listen to the sound test. And this is where we're getting our audio from. And there is a, there is a track in there. It's called the rap test. You, you guys want to listen to that real quick? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That was the rap test from the sound test in Quartet in the Arcade. He clearly just got his sampler and went to town. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think you could have used more yips, to be honest. <laughs> more yips. <laughs> more yips. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a that's a fun one. I like that one a lot. So uh, Quartet, the soundtrack, was really well-loved, and it got a few different CD releases. So it was part of the Sega Game Music Volume 2. It, only the main theme of Quartet made it in there. But then in 2005, there was another release by Sega, which was SDI and Quartet. It was both the soundtracks for those games. And then uh, a little bit later on, 2010, Wavemaster released a three-disc set from the Sega System 16 Complete soundtrack, and this is part of Volume 1. And uh, you can find, we'll put links, actually, to the Amazon stuff. I think it might be domestic for Japan only, so you might not be able to actually buy them. But um, we'll let you guys know where those are located in case you have means, I guess. There's another one too, uh, the DRAM remix, and it has the FM Funk song on there. Oh, nice. Was that a remix album? Yeah, it was a remix album with a bunch of other Sega songs. I think, uh, I want to say it's Beyond, uh, Beyond the Galaxy and uh, a couple other ones, but I know FM Funk was on there, and it was a pretty cool oh. remix. Electric Boogaloo knows all about it too. Oh, yeah. He'll, he'll probably mm-hmm. be posting stuff in the Discord uh, uh, when this episode comes out. We'll get the link to it for sure. We'll, we'll get the link to it. So let's get into our next track, Gene. So, we've gotten through most of the arcade music, but in the SMS version, we mentioned there's six stages. The first four use arranged versions of the arcade tracks, but stage five and six and and a few other tunes are actually original. So we're going to listen to a song that's only on the Master System version, and this is stage five. was stage five for quartet and the master system pretty cool this doesn't have a hayashi feel in the beginning to me but then about 20 30 seconds in then it's very recognizable i think yeah i think the difference is that the initial groove that he lays down isn't quite as strong but once it does what a lot of his tracks do which is kind of like move into a b section that just progresses the track it's like ah yeah we're getting those quartet vibes here for sure for sure and i think yeah that b section it kind of just keeps going through the rest of the track it doesn't really revert back to that early kind of intro part much so uh yeah no i think it's a great track yeah this actually used to be one of my favorite songs of all time <laughs> when i was a kid i really like it <laughs> i mean i i just i just love the feel of it and everything and i I went to the arcade and I played like for because there was like a, a nickel arcade at one time and I tried to play as far as I can get to hear the song and lo and behold it was not there. Sad. Yeah. But you know and when they were making this for the arcade they probably were like well we got enough uh, let's cut this and <laughs> put it out there. I mean they didn't even have the system 16 ready yet and so <laughs> they, yeah. this almost feels like a what would you call it like a, like a test game for the system or I think you're right, man. Like it really does kind of feel it, it does it's not like it's not polished and it's not good. It just feels like I guess like if you were gonna make it like a dev kit for somebody, this would be like one of the sample games you'd give them. Be like, hey, look at all the stuff you could do with the system sixteen. Well, it's it's like it feels to me like a really polished tech demo. I mean, there's no ending, there's kinda like a 
five second intro. The there's not that much music in it. You know, it's like four main themes. Yeah. Like I could definitely see they just wanted to get something out there with their new hardware just as a proof of concept. So right. and maybe it just did so well that they were instantly thinking, oh, this has got to go on the, the master system. Or maybe the conversion was just easy enough to where they could do it. I don't know. But we got some more music out of the the home port, right? So we have another track here that's the same track, but a System 16-like kind of arrangement. And it was by an artist known as For Me, uh, both on Nico Nico and YouTube. So let's take a quick listen to that. That was the Stage 5 arrangement by For Me, originally composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. And somebody was so upset that they didn't have an FM version of the SMS music that they decided to make it themselves. Yeah. And I agree with them. Yeah, pretty pretty <laughs> cool track, though. Really nice arrangement. Um, I think that it's got everything there, maybe, that would have been in the arcade version. It's got a lot of punch to it, light, really nice kind of brassy chords. It's great. I mean, not all of my dreams have come true in my life, but this is one of them. <laughs> and, I, and I was really happy, extremely happy when this happened to be in YouTube. I, I just searched for it on YouTube. I was like, stage five FM. Let me see if it pops up. Oh my God, what? Click, click, click. And I loved it. You know, it's a shame that Double Target, the um, Sega Master System or the Mark III, um, didn't get a Sega Master System, a Japanese FM kind of version of it i you know I, we were talking about this before we started recording and maybe it was just a timing thing like they just didn't have it you know the fm stuff done in the master system in japan but it seems like a, a missed opportunity you know yeah it was right at that edge we were looking it up they both released in 87 but quartet came out quite a few months before so it was probably we don't really have time to make an fm arrangement so we'll just ship it without it but if it had been six months later it we probably would have had probably one, yeah. would have seen something, yeah. It would, kind of nice. would have been one of the one of the few good uh, FM arrangements on the the master system, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, anyways, so let's talk about the graphics of Quartet a little bit. We've talked about the gameplay. There's a big difference between the Sega Master System and the arcade, but let's first focus on the arcade. Uh, I think it, it you know, it's kind of pastel colors and stuff, but it looks really nice. Yeah, I mean, I think it's got a really cool, bright, a lot of solid bright colors and pastels. It's kind of a weird color palette, but it's so distinct. I really, I find myself, like, it's a very recognizable looking game if you were to catch some screens of it or see it in the arcades. And um, I guess that's to Kadama's credit because everything looks, like you said, vibrant. And I don't know if that would be the same thing if it was developed, you know, overseas in the U.S. I don't know. I think it would have more of an action tone to it, probably grittier. You know, this more was like, like Contra kind of look to something it or like something. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. If Atari took over, it would have been like all brown. Like, yeah, brown. <laughs> <laughs> Just everything. Yeah, but it does have really nice color palette, I think, and it's very bright. It kind of has the fantasy zone kind of look 
too. I think even, the same because even uh, even even uh, xenophobe, you know, that has it's a little bit uh, grittier and darker if you think about it. You yeah, know, it's true. Like, you know, it's true. around the same time. Yeah, yeah, and the Master System version is equally as pleasant on the eyes. I think that it has a, a, a darker color palette, but that's because of the master system, maybe it's, yeah. itself, but it, it looks pretty faithful. I mean, the, you don't have as many pixels on the screen, but it looks pretty darn close for the most part. Most of my early experiences with quartet were with the master system version. And when I went to the arcade, I was surprised at how different the game was. I was like, well, it seems like a perfectly good game on this system looks good plays well right i felt i thought it was just a port because i had never played the original in the arcade it kind of reminds me of the the way that like so i played bionic commando first on the nes yeah and then i played it in the arcade and i was like whoa oh yeah it's a huge difference one thing i wanted to mention was that the monster design is a little bit different in the master system version the bosses are a little bit more monster like whereas in the arcade version they're a bit more like robots and well i, I yeah. thought it was supposed to be robots right wasn't that the the whole thing they're all robots they yeah were fighting against but they they look one of the bosses in the master system version looks like a dragon you know it's it's kind of a <laughs> sure they i mean they're they're not <laughs> it's not like a one-to-one -one thing they they went with a bit of a different style which i don't mind too much but they are like we talked about they're pretty different games yeah. So we got another track here that's unique to the Master System. This is Round 6, or Stage 6, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. Stage 6 from the Sega Master System version of Quartet, composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. You know, I didn't care for this one as much as the other one, uh, Stage 5. Like you said, uh, it doesn't sound like characteristic of his com compositions. This doesn't sound characteristic at all. It's a little sad sounding, right? It doesn't have that yeah. peppiness to it, I guess. You got a lot another of these long trails. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was just saying, another thing that's weird about it is uh, if you let it play, it starts to go out of sync. So, like, it just sounds like a jumbled mess of, like, tones and everything. It does towards the end. I, I just wasn't vibing off it as much. It's interesting for sure. But, eh, you know. I mean, I can see he was trying to push polyphony on the master system. Like, what if I have notes kind of, like, on top of each other and kind of give it a really thick sound? But it just comes off as kind of... Yeah, it's a, little, too chaotic. it's a little messy. I mean, I think it's got some really... There are some really cool moments in there. There's a part when... I'm trying to think. It's like... Da, 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 da. It's kind of... I like that yeah, part, actually. Really I cool know exactly section. what you're talking yeah. about. Yep. Well, it, but it actually sounds more like Double Dragon and, yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> than it does yeah, Quartet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, like I said, it's a little dark sounding. It doesn't really have the same mood as any of the other tracks and this is pretty late in the game too this is like the last area right well so. in fairness it is the last stage before the final boss so but it doesn't it, give that true. that it doesn't give that uh that kind of panic feel that you would expect from a like a end like layer or end level kind of thing no not really yeah a little more just sad sad <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Trump tweet, but go ahead. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, so this game wasn't just ported to the Master System. It actually saw several other ports to home computers, like the C64, the ZX Spectrum, the Amstrad CPC. The C64 version, very short levels, way too easy. There's almost no robots or enemies on the screen at all. It has really bad slowdowns, and it just doesn't look very good at all. Now, the the plus side, you can actually play with all four players at the same time, which is pretty rad on the C64. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. We do have a track here from the SID chip. Uh, This is... I kind of resemble Sky, I guess. This is Subsong 6, composed or arranged by David Wedeker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was certainly something from the Commodore sixty four version of uh, Quartet. Yeah, you know, David Whitaker is a excellent composer, but yeah. this song is just like kind of half assed. I feel the whole soundtrack feels like it was thrown together in a couple hours. Like, and some of those Commodore so. sixty four games were like that too. Like, you have oh, to write totally. this by this afternoon. Nineteen eighty seven. This was released, and so it was like right. Like, as soon as the Master System version was out, like, they're like, ah, we got to put it on all these other systems that we can. <laughs> you know, give him props for at least... Yeah, I don't want I don't want to be ne- negative towards him because you never know what he was going through at that time. <laughs> Who knows? One man's poop is another man's rose. Exactly. And he is an excellent composer. You know, to be fair, though, a lot of those quartet songs have lots of syncopation, crazy things going on transcribing that would have taken way too long so i can kind of see the like well we'll get the feel of it and kind of go off in our own direction yeah 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 it's yep, not yep. it's not a bad track it's no, just you no, know it's, 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 it's a very early sid track and spun up in a european style i guess uh so we have a few tracks here from the zx spectrum and the amstrad cpc so let's go ahead and play those and we're back there is no music in those games <laughs> So, sorry, that was a bad joke. Um, Yeah, there's no music. The weapon shots look like a mouse cursor. Um, It's pretty bad on both versions. The Amstrad CPC, oh my God. That is the worst looking version. Like, if you're going to play Quartet, just skip all of these and don't even, you know, maybe there's some people who have fond memories of this, the C64 version, but the ZX Spectrum, the Amstrad CPC, don't even bother. It's, it was not even, it didn't even look like it, was any effort like <laughs> if you can't tell from the music you got to play the arcade or the master system version that's where all of the the resources went right right so stepping back over to the master system we have a track here this is the final boss composed by katsuhiro hayashi the final boss theme composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi for the SMS. That was a nice return to form. I mean, it definitely sounds like Quartet again after stage six. I felt like it had those kind of leading, the leading notes that sort of keep you waiting for the next thing coming up next. See, I really like this track, but I didn't get a final boss feel at all. I didn't get a final boss feel, but I got a quartet feel. I got a quartet feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like like I said, these tracks had no names, you know, on the sound test. 
I never knew this was the final boss theme. I thought it was the ending. <laughs> the ending. Yeah, it kind of kind of has more of an ending feel to it. Cool track. Let's uh, move on to the ending theme. This is the ending theme for the Sega Master System. That was the ending theme from the Sega Master System version of Quartet. That's a ending theme right there. A nice little short uh, closing it up, you know, taking it home. Yeah. Now, so the last track didn't sound like a final boss track. This one didn't really sound like a quartet track to me. Nah, could have fit in any game that needed an ending. So, Norm, you beat this game, right? On the Master System? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> not oh. I saw <laughs> you said the he got stuck on level four. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I, I used I used the hint, but I couldn't couldn't find the key. I guess none of us actually heard this during uh, during the actual gameplay, but yeah, it's yeah, it's cool. I guess yeah. yeah. Well, we didn't yes. end the show on it. No, we didn't. No. <laughs> but uh, we are uh, wrapping up here. Any final thoughts on Quartet? I think it is, it's easily one of my favorite uh, soundtracks of all time. It's not perfect. You know, there's some songs that just don't really work like that uh, stage six theme and the ending theme to me. But it's still a very, very memorable soundtrack uh, from the arcade to the SMS. I think a lot of that is nostalgia too, right? I mean, it's a great Uh, soundtrack, don't get me wrong, but the nostalgia factor plays in, I'm sure. I think for me, it's just... I didn't grow up with this game, but it has such a catchy vibe. It's so good, and it's a real shame there wasn't more quartet, that kind of this world that they built. I feel like some games, especially Sega, you know, has a long history of these games that kind of go on for many years, but this was kind of it. You know, you had a couple of ports, like the original, the Master System, and not too much. Yeah, so. I only remember the quartet theme I mean, from when I was a kid, that's the only one that I really remember. But I mean, I was a kid and we would shove in quarters and we would get tired and walk away and play something else. Later on in life, when I started listening to more game music outside of context, uh, obviously Oki Rap, FM Funk, those are classics. But um, yeah, the soundtrack has a, a, a very classic Sega feel to it. And I think that it's, it's very endearing to a lot of people, a lot of fans of Sega and Master System fans, too. And I just, like you said about the uh, it not going anywhere, it's, those characters easily could have been in another game or anything. Like, they really look really it's cool. A shame. It's a shame like the they, they could have totally used them. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah. They did not. I think it's time we wrap up here. So today we covered Quartet on the arcade and the Master System version. We talked about the ports a little bit, but those don't count. And uh, it was all composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi. I had a lot of fun. Uh, listening to music with you guys quartet is a, a fun game and if you haven't had a chance to play it load up mame or uh whatever you know pico drive or whatever emulator you want to play it on and give it a shot it's a lot of fun keep thinking yeah, one this, of you guys is going to say something but <laughs> yeah i don't want to cut gene off so, i mean i'm all the way in chicago so <laughs> i can't oh, see what yeah, you're doing yeah but uh i was i, I could just yeah, I was going to say, it was a lot of fun doing the show. I love this show. I love Pixelated Audio. I love our Discord channel and everybody who's a part of it. And it was a great time. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course, dude. And, you know, uh, it was really great having you on. Hopefully, we can get you on more episodes, not just Quartet. You know, we can keep this this going. Now, you do have a YouTube channel where you post a lot of sound test stuff for voices you want to talk about that a little bit (laughs) yeah for some reason i just felt like i should do it because i love listening to arcade voices only a key opens the door but uh yes it's (laughs) rise from your grave and we all know that's from uh altered beast for the genesis so it's just literally rise from your grave and just all a bunch of voices from like various arcade games nes super nintendo blah 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 and also, you know, I'm normally retro, basically everything. One word, normally retro. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So if you want to know more about the show, you can check us out online at pixelatedaudio.com for our show notes and our track list. We can also be found on Twitter at pixelatedaudio. If you like the show, please leave some comments on iTunes. That's always appreciated. 
Uh, if you want to help support us, uh, you can go to our Patreon website. That really helps support the show, and it goes into equipment and website costs and server stuff. Uh, you know, this is a nonprofit uh, entity, and so Gene and I just put this money back into the show uh, to provide more content. So if you feel like you want to help us out, that's always appreciated. And if you're new to our podcast, check out some of our past episodes. Yeah, we got uh, episode 29, Double Dragon 2. We talked about that game for whatever reason a few times in the show. It's a good one to go back to. It's just various versions (laughs) of themes from the various Double Dragon games. Kind of a lot of comparisons, very similar to this episode. Right. Uh, Very recently, we had an episode about Japan Pro Golf Tour 64, episode 109. That was a really fun one. That was a good one. We did some pretty cool deep dives into (laughs) Shinzawa-san. That was nice. Uh, We also did the Music Disc, volume 4. That was our last episode. So if you like FM synthesis and you like the 2608, take a listen to that. Norm, uh, any episodes that, that you liked i guess over the last four or five years we've been doing this show i mean every one of them but the wonder boy the wonder boy three dragons trap one uh that was really awesome when we had the uh composers from the new one meet up with sakamoto and then hear his thoughts too it was just really awesome yeah yeah we gotta have some more interviews like i mean we have a bunch lined up we just gotta do them (laughs) you know we gotta Uh, get people on the calendar that was a that was a fun episode Norm, it was really great to have you on the show. I have to say, we love having guests. Composer interviews are great, but there's a different kind of energy when it's just a bunch of people vibing over their shared memories. It was so much fun to have you on the show. And like Brian said, we hope we can bring you back in a few in the future. Yeah, and you have to do a rap for our show next. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That was, it was mad fun. Though. I loved it. Yeah, every minute. I mean, I, I, how can I not love going on through quartet? Oh yeah, I know. Anyways, we got one final track taken out the show, and this is a remix because we, we haven't done that in a while. We used to play like an OC remix track or something at the end of our episodes, and we want to try to get back into that when we can. This is a longer one, but it's pretty rad. Yeah, there was one more port of Quartet we didn't mention so far. There was a Sega Ages release that had SDI and Quartet for the PS2, and this was the song that plays during the title screen. It's a medley covering all of the themes of Quartet. Originally composed by Katsuhiro Hayashi and arranged by Mitsuharu Fukuyama, and it's performed by former members of the SST band in the new Sega band called H, or bracket H period. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> whatever it's called. Yeah. I say that. And on keyboard and trumpet, we've got Mitsuharu Fukuyama, the arranger. On keyboards, again, we have Hiroshi Kawaguchi, should be a pretty familiar name. On bass, Takanobu Mitsuyoshi, and guitar, Keitaro Hanada. So taking out the show enjoy the quartet medley 2005 see you guys in a few weeks for the next episode